So the book, The Waning of the Autumn and the Middle Ages, um, studied a period um, in, um, between the late 14th and the 15th century in an area of Europe that we call the Low Countries, which is today northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and pieces of Germany principally. The reason why we pursued this workshop is because this book, even though it's coming up upon its centenary, almost 100 years old, is one of the most popular books um, in medieval, medieval European history, and it's widely read throughout the world today, and in fact, it's a global bestseller. It's been translated recently, um, over the last 15 years, in Korean, Japanese, and Mandarin. And it could be, it could, so it's continuing to be translated into multiple languages throughout the world. So the workshop brought together a group of scholars of the area of Europe, the Low Countries, about which the book was written, it's for us to confront this very curious phenomenon, which is this is one of the best-selling books in medieval history, written about a period and a time of which we're specialists. And yet this book um, is more popular in the general public today than it is with specialists in the field. So we're, we were trying to assess why this book has such a global popularity and why it endures as a work of scholarship even though it's a hundred years old. The book was dedicated to uh, two questions um, that were of central concern to this historian, Johann Huizinga. One was this part of Europe, the Low Countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and parts of Germany, at this period, was this period, like it was in the South, a new beginning? as historians of the Italian period, the Italian Renaissance argued, or was it something else? And then second, um, to the question also, the second question was, what is the significance of the, what the, what the historian Johann Huygens saw, Johann Huygens saw as a, a, a fundamental um, gap, uh, cultural and political gap between art and literature and society? Art and literature that seemed to be um, centered around notions of aesthetic beauty and the search for what he called uh, a more perfect life and a reality of a violent, outer kilter, politically unstable society. So how could you have art on the one hand that was very sublime um, and on the other hand a society that was rent with violence um, and, and, and political uh, problems of the highest order. And so what is remarkable about the book is that Johann Huizinga did not use traditional sources that a historian used at this time. He was interested in a wide or portrait of society. And the way he thought he could get at that portrait was through literature, through art, um, through chronicles, and through a whole range of other non-traditional sources that historians mostly hadn't pursued, and so that he could conjure up a total social uh, portrait of, of a society. And he came to a couple of conclusions. He came to the conclusion that the north of Europe at this time was fundamentally different from the south, and that the world in which he was studying was an end point, not a new point. That it was a culmination of a series of centuries rather than what people thought, historians thought in the South was a new beginning, the Renaissance. And second, to answer his second question, this culmination was problematic. And this was why there was an outer, outer kilter society in a gulf between art and, and, and society. And that is that the society um, was, the society had, had reached a kind of break, breaking point in which the normative values the values by which people proclaimed to live were divorced from the reality of how they lived. In other words, they were, they were attached to a series of suppositions and principles and morals that were in fact no longer what they said they were. And that there was a gulf therefore between thought, aesthetics, art, and reality. And, and that gulf is because of the break between what he said was what he called form and content. And so um, I think one of the enduring importances of this book is that he was able to create a portrait of a very fractured and troubled society where on the one hand you had great aesthetics, great works of art, great works of literature, great works of music, on the other hand 
a society that seems to us so deeply violent and problematic, and how these two could exist together at the same time. And that's a problem that we historians assess that he's got perhaps wrong factually, but that as a proposition and a, a, as an um, a, a, a interpretation of a, of, of a social condition that has, has intrigued people and that people have found relevant not only to this period but to other periods in time including today. One of the things about this book that is really interesting is that it has been translated into, I don't know how many languages, many, many, many languages. It's read all over the world and it is read outside the academy. But the academy, i.e. universities, have had a terrible time figuring out what to do with this book and how to read it. So our workshop was focused on why it's been so hard to take charge of for even specialists of this period and this place the great Burgundian Netherlands, where the greatest court in Europe in that period existed, and which set the standards for the Tudor court and the French court to follow. Standards of elegance, of learning, of display, of performance, etc. But scholars have, over the century that this book has been so widely read, talked about, it's part of a canon in medieval historiography, and it's never been grappled with fully. And the other thing I can say as a teacher, and all of us are teachers, um, our students don't know what to do with the book. So we wanted to have, sort of open it up for ourselves and figure out why it was so important, why so influential in shaping people's understanding of this period and this court, and yet so intractable for all of us. So the workshop was very productive because it did two things. Number one, it helped us understand better what Hersinger was up to because it placed him in his time at the moment of the beginning of what we call scientific history. The moment when a certain kinds of sources were privileged and certain kinds of reading strategies, ways to use the sources, what kinds of truths they revealed, etc., was becoming dominant. The term that's used in historiography among historians to talk about what this method was, was that it's positivist. That there's a kind of, and this is a simple definition, but a kind of positive learn, uh, information truth that can come from using certain kinds of sources responsibly. Um, what we learned in this workshop, I think that was most useful for me, and I think it, for our students when we teach this book again, is that Hausinger refused that method. That what he did instead was choose different kinds of sources. He chose chronicles, which were basically the newspapers of the age. They were just reports of what was happening at the court. And they were extremely partisan. You think our press is partisan? You have no idea how partisan this press was. They were in the ploy, employ of the court. Or they were employ in the employ, I think that's the right word, of a, 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 an enemy court. So that you get very biased pictures of what people were doing. Uh, that, those was his major form of evidence. The other kind of evidence he used was more literary. Uh, poems and prose poems that expressed a lot of the ideals of the period. And the, the central themes that he worked on were indeed the notion that this court and this whole society he, he uh, deduced from the performance of the court, the way the society worked, was performing a kind of longing for a certain kind of ideal that was heroic, um, honorable, chivalric, um, that uh, a world composed of people with high morals, with pure religious beliefs, with the capacity for real spiritual experiences, etc., and at the same time, ignoring the way they really lived. The fact that people were killing each other all the time, that the, the, the politics were unstable, that in fact, this is the beginning of the Reformation period when the canons of faith were under attack all, all over this region. And this is one of the regions in which the Reformation was experienced most violently, most early, and most radically. So 
what he was trying to do was to understand what these ideals were. And so he went to the kind of literature that discussed these ideas and presented them. Um, so his focus was on performance and on the way performances were described. We use words like ritual, like display, etc. He uh, didn't really use those words. What he did was just describe the way these sources portrayed the court in action. Um, so we learned better what kind of a method that was. We also then spent a lot of time talking about all the things that he missed, that he refused to talk about, that would have changed the picture. I think the major one was, for me anyway, and I think for a lot of the people in the room, the fact that this was not only the home of the most successful court in the sense of a courtly culture in this period in Europe. It was also the home of next to northern Italy, but really equal with northern Italy, the most commercially advanced area of Europe in the time. People that write books about the origins of capitalism can start here. And the follow-up to this particular moment in this period, this is, the, this is the period when Bruges and Antwerp and cities like that were the New York and the London of northern Europe. They were followed by Amsterdam and then followed even later by London. But this is the beginning of that kind of an economy. Uh, so that's going on simultaneously. And of course, the, the court lived from that wealth. And he, Hershinger never talked about it. So we spent a lot of time thinking why he didn't talk about it. What was the payoff of not talking about it? We did have one paper that tried to take up the question of whether he really talked about it in a different way. Um, I don't think we were completely convinced that he really did, but I think we, we learned to look at his book a little differently and to think about it not as a book that was sort of very engaging because it described uh, the performance of this court in vivid language overwhelmed the reader with the details from the sources that he used. Uh, one, when one reads it, I had one student who said, he, when he first read it, he was completely baffled by it. You don't know what to make of it, but you're, you're beaten down by the learning of this guy. Um, but what we, I think what we learned from this is that he intended to beat you down. <laughs> He wanted to make you see that these sources are telling you about that these performances were not just performances, they were almost anguished efforts to not recognize and not deal with what was going on on the ground around them. There are two ways to think about the relationship between commerce, the, all these rich cities that were feeding this court, and, and housing his refusal to talk about it, and for the most part, the refusal of the sources he used to talk about it. Um, one way is that they are denying the fact that in fact this is a commercialized court. The other way to think about it is, is that they are trying to capture the commercial economy and make it their own. That by display, the way they perform themselves is with wealth. I mean, they talk about chivalric deeds and all that kind of stuff. They have silver swords and velvet dresses and gold embossed this, etc. When you, in fact, when you look at the costumes of the late Middle Ages that the aristocracy wrote, these are the Burgundian costumes. And so that's commercial wealth put on the bodies of the aristocracy that lived from this wealth but did not produce it. Focusing on one particular book, inevitably implies that one also focuses on the personality of uh, the author of the book. Um, now, Johan Huizinga, uh, to some extent, was a quite um, atypical uh, historian at, uh, at his time. Um, and he was quite different from uh, his contemporaries, not only in the way uh, he dealt with uh, sources and the problematic, as uh, Martha Hubble just said,
but also by his training and by the, the several topics he tackled during his, uh, his career. Um, originally he studied Sanskrit and he uh, had a great uh, interest in the performances at the court of uh, what was then known as the, the Dutch uh, Indies, uh, present-day Indonesia, uh, which also works well and, and has an influence on the way he looks at the Burgundian court and the performative uh, aspects of, uh, of, of courtly life. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that he came almost by accident because he had to, to, to get into uh, a position that was free at that moment at uh, the university where he worked uh, when uh, writing uh, the book The Autumn of the Middle Ages, the University of Groningen in the north of the, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, and he had to turn into a medieval historian. Um, he rather quickly wrote a dissertation on the sources of uh, the, the juridical sources and the political sources of the city of Haarlem in the, in the province of, uh, of, uh, of Holland, but never came back to that uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, he really loathed uh, the technical aspects of medieval history that in the traditional way of dealing with history uh, were ranking high at that uh, moment. Instead of that, he wrote his uh, autumn of the, the Middle Ages. It's very important to be aware of the fact that uh, the book, as we said, is published for the first time in 1990, but that he wrote it during World War I. Um, somebody, uh, one of the commentators, the earlier commentators, uh, uh, labeled it even a book of remembrance uh, because he reflects uh, when he deals with uh, the importance of death, of collective death, the plague in the, uh, in the Middle Ages, but he does so when thinking about what's happening in his own time. Uh, and we know that he was very much preoccupied by, uh, by uh, all the events that seemed to uh, break away uh, the whole society, Western society, as it uh, presented itself at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and that seemed to collapse uh, forever in the course of the First uh, World War. So that's an important uh, thing that, uh, that has a, a direct uh, effect on the tonality and, and on the way uh, the book is, uh, uh, is written. And if we go back, uh, or, or if we uh, enlarge the focus and look at the whole of his uh, scientific uh, production, one may say that at first, uh, at first glance uh, you have the impression that he hops from uh, to, to very different uh, topics uh, he writes two books on America, um, in which also he expresses uh, his uneasiness with uh, modernity uh, in society. Uh, that's also something that can be linked to the, uh, the major theme of uh, the, the Autumn book. Um, he writes, and that was a book that came up in the workshop time and again, uh, a, a very interesting uh, book, Homo Ludens, on the, the element of play uh, as well in individual life as in society. Uh, and that has still has a very, uh, as we learned uh, also yesterday, a concrete uh, effect uh, and is applied, is, is commented upon in the gaming industry, uh, for instance, uh, nowadays. Um, and then in the 30s, uh, he writes two books. Uh, one book that is very influential, uh, the, the title is uh, In the Shadow of Tomorrow, in which he uh, warns his contemporaries of what he feels is uh, maybe the consequences of the new political order uh, that breaks through in the, in the 30s, uh, namely fascism in Germany and in Italy, uh, communist uh, uh, totalitarian regime in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, that again uh, is, is these books, which were also very influential, got translated into all major uh, languages uh, of the time, gave him the reputation of being one of the, um, uh, the, the philosophers, uh, the ethical thinkers about what was going on uh, in the 30s, that these books are also uh, very much determined by the same way of looking at, uh, at society and at uh, change in society that is already present in the, in the waning of the Middle Ages. So if you look at the whole of his career and of his production, uh, there is contrary to what one might think uh, at the first place, namely that he's really somebody uh, who hops from one team to another, 
the, there is more coherence uh, than one would say at, uh, at, at the first glance.